Welcome to Keen Motion's course on understanding electricity and electronics devices. Today, we're going to start with our fifth class. Um, as usual, we will start with the review of what we saw in previous classes. Uh, last class, we saw resistors in series and parallel, then voltage divider, variable resistors, and we learned about electric power. On the previous class, we also studied switches. Keep uh, the part of switches in mind because that will come handy today when we study really. And that brings us to the topics that uh, we're going to be covering today. So today we're going to be uh, studying electricity and magnetism and how they are related or some of the relationships there. Electromagnets, DC motors, relays and transformers. So let's start with electricity and magnetism. Magnetism um, can be generated by current flowing through a wire. In this case, we have a wire here, and these lines represent the magnetic field that this current creates when it flows. All right. Um, now we can take advantage of that uh, magnetic field and measure it with a specific device. So if we build an instrument that has a magnetic sensor uh, and uh, knowing that uh, the magnetic field uh, increases when the current increases uh, through the conductor, we could calculate how much current is flowing through the conductor by measuring the magnetic field. And that is exactly what a device like this does. This is called um, a clamp meter. Right? So it's a device uh, built to measure current, electric current. And it, it works by measuring the magnetic field that a conductor creates around it. So if you remember on our first class, we said that to measure current, we have to open the circuit, modify it, and insert an ammeter in there. One of the advantages of using one of these is that you do not have to do that. Why is that? Because you uh, have this button here that opens the clamp uh, on, on the front of the ammeter, and then you can uh, thread the, the cable uh, through this opening and then release uh, the button and the clamp will close with the spring. So because this is not measuring current directly, but measuring the magnetic field around the wire, you don't have to modify the circuit. So that's a very big advantage of this. The disadvantage is that um, these uh, things are not very sensitive. So these are usually used to measure uh, very high currents. So uh, they can usually measure currents from 0 0.1 amp or 100 milliamps and above uh, up to a few kiloamps. So this is for, for big electrical installations, really. In electronics, uh, th their use is limited um, because of their low sensitivity. But just be aware that these things exist. Now, the magnetic field that uh, a conductor creates around it can be increased if um, the conductor is coiled, right? So if we have a, like a core maybe of, made of iron or some other magnetic material, we can um, coil a wire, a conductor around it, and uh, the magnetic field is going to add up on each turn. So this way, we're concentrating um, all the magnetic field from each turn into this core. Um, some of you may have uh, done this experiment in school where you connect a battery to um, uh, something like this, a, a coil uh, wrapped around a nail or a screw or a bolt or some other uh, magnetic core, and uh, you have an electromagnet, right? An electromagnet uh, works as a magnet as long as current is flowing. Once you disconnect the battery, current stops flowing, and this thing um, doesn't uh, attract any metal anymore. But still, usually a small residual magnetism on the core, but it's usually much, much lower than what we have when current is flowing through it. So this uh, allows us to construct a magnet, a magnet 
that can be turned on or off as we want. And this has uh, several applications. Um, one uh, is a solenoid actuator. It looks something like this. So this is covered in tape, but the coil would be in here under this tape and it would be would have a couple of uh, wires coming out over here where you would be connecting a battery or another voltage source. And the way this works is um, whenever a current flows uh, through this coil, this will pull on this core. This core is movable, right? So um, as you can see, it's, it's held in an extended position by this spring. But when you energize this, this core will pull and will go inside, um, inside the coil. So this can be used to um, produce motion. So if you need any short motion, um, uh, short and linear motion, this is a very good device to provide that. Um, another application is a solenoid valve, which is something like this. This could be for water or for air. So you would uh, connect water here. This would be, um, you can probably see the arrow here. So this is the inlet and this is the outlet. So you connect uh, a water hose or pipe over here and you can control the flow of water by turning on and off this electromagnet that uh, actuates in a very similar way to this, um, to this solenoid actuator, only it is coupled with a mechanism inside the valve that will stop or allow the flow of water or air. So these are very used in, for instance, in irrigation systems. You may have one of these in your house. If you have an automatic irrigation system, it is uh, very likely that it will have something very similar to this one. Another application is a, a, an electric door strike, which looks something like this. So when you um, activate a, a solenoid inside an electromagnet, you can push on the door and this will open. Uh, when you don't have this um, energized, uh, this locks internally and you push on the door and the door is locked. All right. So there are several applications of these um, solenoids. Another application of this combination between uh, magnetism and electricity is uh, the DC motor. So we're going to have a look at uh, the working principle of a DC motor. DC motors uh, come in a wide variety um, of uh, configurations and sizes and everything else, but the basic functionality is, is similar to this one. We're going to look at uh, uh, what we call a, a, um, a permanent magnet DC motor. So this is the structure of it. Um, it's a cylinder, right? We're looking at the cylinder here. And it has uh, uh, magnets with two poles, south pole over here and north pole over here. So this creates a magnetic field in here. The, the static part, the part that doesn't move or the outer, normally it's the outer part of the motor is called a stator. And this is where the permanent magnets are. The part that rotates, it's called the rotor. And in this uh, construction, we have an electromagnet. How does this work? Well, we have this electromagnet and it is connected to um, the two terminals from the motor that will be connected maybe to a battery, positive and negative terminals. And these connect to these uh, slip rings, if you want to call them like that, or this is uh, usually called the collector. So this uh, circle here actually rotates uh, with the electromagnet. But these contacts, the red and the black um, slide, um, are, are not fixed to these uh, central contacts. So they are just touching, and but allowing these to turn. OK. Um, so how does this work? Let's assume we put positive here and negative here, and this will create uh, 
an electromagnet here with the North Pole here and the South Pole here. Now the North Pole will be rejected by this North Pole and the South Pole will be rejected by this South Pole. And also the North Pole will be attracted to the South Pole and the South to the North. So that will produce a force um, on this rotor that's gonna try to make it turn um, counterclockwise. So to the left over here on top. Right, so it will move it uh, maybe to this position, but uh, again, the, the South Pole is gonna be stronger here in the middle and the North is gonna be stronger over here. So this will rotate a little bit more, maybe to this position. It's gonna overshoot a little bit uh, because of the speed that it has. Now, you may have not paid attention, but um, these collector halves now are in an opposite direction. The half that was previously touching the positive is now touching the negative, and the half that is now um, touching the positive was previously touching the negative. So we reversed the polarity of uh, the current flowing through the electromagnet. So really, when we reach this position, we have a North Pole here and a South Pole here. Now again, the North Pole is going to be rejected by this North Pole and the South Pole is going to be rejected by this one. So the, the rotor is going to keep rotating um, to the left on top or counterclockwise direction. And that is um, the basic uh, way a, a DC motor works. So like I said, these small DC motors are usually uh, made of a combination of permanent magnets and electromagnets. They have two terminals on the outside and the direction depends on the polarity. Um, you put positive on one side and negative on the other side and it uh, will turn in one direction. If you reverse the polarity, it will turn in a, the opposite direction. Speed and torque um, depend on the voltage. So if you put a lower voltage, that will turn uh, at a lower speed and the motor will have less torque or less force. Remember for uh, torque is uh, like force, but for rotating systems. And the current will depend on the mechanical load. So if uh, we let uh, the motor spin freely, it will take less current from the power supply. And if we put some load there, like we hold it with the hand or we try to uh, get some mechanical um, work done from it, maybe my, by moving um, a pump or moving a fan or something like that, that's gonna increase the current that it's gonna be taking from the power supply. Small DC motors uh, of the type we uh, I showed you the way they work, and this is what they actually look uh, outside. These are uh, many times used for toys, right? Um, those tend to have a very high speed and low torque. So what, what's usually done on those are they're combined with the gearbox, like this one here. The gearbox is a series of gears that uh, reduce the speed and increase, increases the torque. A motor will usually be specified um, for a, a set voltage and uh, it will be have a, a speed and torque specified. And that's usually mostly for, um, for the gear motors, for when the motor gets combined with, um, uh, with the gearbox. All right, so let's Talk about relays now. A relay is a switch activated by an electromagnet. So this is uh, how it works. Uh, I, the picture does not show it very clearly, but you can see a coil here. This has um, probably hundreds or maybe even more um, turns here of a very, very thin wire. The wire uh, that we use here is called magnet wire or enameled wire. It's basically um, bare copper, 
but paint it with a with an enamel with a paint with a special paint that uh, will make um, it as an insulator on the outside. So the the different turns are not electrically connected to each other, right? Otherwise, if you used bare copper, um, this would be a, a complete short circuit. Current would be flowing instead of flowing around uh, the core, they will be flowing straight through this one. So this is a special wire called magnet wire. Okay. So um, what you see here are the contacts of a switch. So when the magnet is energized, um, it will pull this lever up and move this thing forward. When this uh, uh, lever moves forward over here, it's gonna make this contact touch this contact and stop touching this other one. Um, next slide, we have a, a better picture of this, um, of an electromagnet. But basically the way the, it works is uh, like a switch activated uh, by an electromagnet. And this is uh, the symbol. Um, and this is another symbol. This uh, can be, um, you will see either of these two. There are other options which are different variants here. So what you see here is a, a double pull, double throw switch. Um, if you remember from our second class, we studied uh, this, right? Um, the dotted line means uh, that the two switches are connected together mechanically. And uh, this dotted line also extends to the coil, meaning that the coil is actually controlling the switch, right? So when current flows through the coil, these um, switches are gonna move to the left, to the A1. It's gonna connect C1 to A1, and it's gonna connect C2 to A2. This one here is the same. It's um, the same idea, only it, uh, the, the contacts are different. And this symbol you will see more in uh, industrial electronics. Um, so this is the coil, A1 and A2 uh, represent the coil. And these are the contacts one, two, and three. Um, pole switch, single throw, normally open, right? The switches are drawn in the normal position. That means when the coil is not energized. So when the coil is energized, um, one connects to two, three connects to four, uh, five connects to six, and 23 connects to 24. 11 and 12 are a normally closed contact. So when we energize the coil, this will open here. So 11 and 12 are normally connected. When we energize the coil, uh, they're gonna open. And this is uh, another picture of an internal construction that I think it shows better. Again, the coil is covered in tape, so it's gonna be behind the tape over here. Um, the contacts for the coil is, uh, one is this one and the other one's gonna be on the other side. And if you have a look at this, uh, this is uh, the core of the coil that's uh, um, making the electromagnet that's going to attract this whole plate here. This plate here has a wire connected to this uh, terminal here, which is a screw. So when uh, when the coil is not energized or norm in its normally pos normal position, this terminal is going to be connected to this other terminal here. When the coil is energized, it pulls um, this movable uh, plate down and uh, this terminal is gonna be connected to this other terminal here. All right. So why go through all this trouble and not just use a simple switch there? Um, well, some applications for relays are to control a higher voltage or um, uh, or higher current circuit. For instance, um, if we want to keep uh, isolation, if, if you 
pay attention here. Uh, there's no electrical contact between the, the low voltage circuit that activates the coil and uh, the other circuit um, that gets switched. So that's um, uh, something that uh, can be used to safely switch uh, high voltage circuits, right? So we know that 120 volts could kill you. So in order to control a um, device that takes 120 volts uh, with a circuit uh, powered up with a lower voltage, maybe five volts or 12 volts, we could use a relay in this case. So in this case, we have a source of 120 volts. This would be your regular outlet. And this could be a lamp or a coffee maker or something like that. Um, so it is connected uh, with, through the contacts of a relay. So this is an, a normally open position. And um, this circuit that is on here is uh, powered by five volts and completely isolated from this one. So you can touch this part of the circuit and it's, it is completely safe to do that. Um, this controller is gonna output five volts and those five volts are gonna activate the relay and that's gonna close the circuit and that's gonna turn on the coffee maker, the lamp or whatever it is that we have connected here. Um, the smart switches that are uh, so uh, much the rage nowadays, uh, everything has to be controlled from a smartphone, those work uh, like this. They uh, would normally have a relay inside that's uh, going to turn on or off wherever you connect to, to them. And then they will have a controller that connects uh, to your Wi-Fi and to your phone. And um, that allows you to turn on and off um, the lamp or the coffee maker or the fan or whatever it is. Um, it may also be used to control higher currents. And this is uh, the case many times in a car. If, um, if you have a look um, at the car, usually a car has a box uh, full of relays. Um, you still do not control the, the headlamps directly with your light switch because the headlamps take a fair amount of current and the light switch um, uh, that is um, um, that has a lot of uh, tiny switches because you have a lot of uh, uh, positions there, right? You have the headlamps on, the, your parking lights, your turn signals and everything else. So because of the many cables that go to that switch to control all the functions, uh, you're limited on the size of those cables, right? So you're running uh, small cables and uh, you cannot control high current with those. Also, um, to fit all the contacts and the complexity of those uh, switches uh, to control the lights there, you cannot use very high, um, very, very high current contacts. So that's an example where you would be using a relay not to control a higher voltage, but to control a higher current device, okay? Okay, so how can we check a relay with a multimeter? Um, the first thing you can do is uh, measure the coil. The coil will have uh, maybe, depending on the relay, but uh, may have around 100 to 200 ohms, maybe a bit less. Um, so you can measure the resistance uh, with a multimeter. So if it is uh, between say 50 and 200 ohms, uh, it's probably good. If it's open, um, like uh, infinite uh, resistance, that's of course bad. And if it's too low, say less than 10 ohms, that's bad as well. The contacts, uh, the normally closed contacts can be checked with the continuity check function of the multimeter. So you, um, connect your multimeter to the two terminals that are normally closed and you should uh, check continuity there. If you wanna check the normally open contacts, the uh, relay would have to be energized with an external power supply. And then uh, turn on the relay and then check the normally open contacts, which should be closed um, in that situation. So if you wanna buy a relay, how do you specify it? Um, 
On the picture on the right, it's uh, the typical relay that you would see on um, on a car. It would look something like that, like a cube, like that. The contacts are going to be on the other side. But something interesting to see is that, uh, well, this wouldn't be a, a car relay because the coil here is specified for five volts, but uh, cars use uh, typically 12 volts. Um, so one of the things you would be specifying is uh, the coil voltage. What's the voltage that you want to put on the coil to make uh, the relay switch? The other um, parameters that you would be specifying for a relay are uh, the, the, um, the ratings of the contact. So because the contacts are switches, all the ratings that we saw for switches would apply for relays. Um, so the number of um, poles and throws or the configuration and uh, the, um, the maximum current and voltage that uh, these can handle. Other things that uh, you may want to look at are the terminals. Um, if the terminals are for soldering on a PCB or if uh, they are screw terminal or spade terminals or what um, kind of kind of terminals they have depending on your application. The next topic is transformers. So let's talk a bit about magnetic coupling. On these uh, previous slides, we saw that current uh, flowing through a wire produces a magnetic field. The same way a variable magnetic field can generate voltage or current in a wire. Uh, to generate current, it would have to be closed on a circuit. Otherwise, it, it would be generating voltage. Now, the key word here is variable. So if you put uh, a permanent magnet next um, to a wire, that's not going to generate anything. But if you move the magnet in such a way that uh, the magnetic field through the wire changes, that's going to generate voltage or current in that wire. And this is something that is used in generators. So a generator, uh, a DC motor can be used as a generator. If you rotate by hand uh, a motor, you are varying the magnetic field uh, through the windings of the motor, and that's uh, going to be generating a voltage. But uh, let's focus on another way of doing this, right? Uh, a variable magnetic field can generate a voltage or current in a wire, and a transformer can use these two processes. So let's have a look at how transformers work. Transformers are built with two or more coils around a magnetic core. The primary coil is connected to an AC source. Remember, an AC source changes direction and, uh, and value several times per second. So this is going to be producing a variable magnetic field in the core, right? So if, if we connected the primary of the transformer, the primary coil to DC source, um, the magnetic field inside the core is going to be fixed. And that's uh, what we do pretty much with an electromagnet. But if we connect that to an AC source, the magnetic field, it's uh, going to have one polarity, then it's going to decrease to zero, then it's going to reverse polarity to a maximum, and then it's going to go back to zero and so on several times per second. So the secondary coil, um, which is another coil um, wound around the same magnetic core, it's going to be picking up the magnetic field produced by the first coil, and that's going to be induced um, um, also a variable um, voltage or current on that uh, secondary coil. Uh, something important uh, to notice is that there's no electrical connection between primary and secondary. It's only magnetic coupling that we have between the two. So the picture on the left uh, shows uh, conceptually uh, what it is like, and it is the symbol of a transformer. So it's a primary uh, winding, a primary coil, a magnetic core, and then a secondary winding. The construction is similar to this one. Um, 
it is a um, magnetic core in the middle with uh, two coils, one primary and one secondary. And uh, the core is closed in this shape. So that provides a better uh, magnetic coupling uh, between the two coils. It pretty much ensures that all the magnetic flux generated by one coil is gonna be picked up by the other coil. And this is what a transformer uh, may look like. It has uh, many terminals here and here because um, the, these two coils, there are several applications where it may be convenient uh, to tap in the, into several middle points of these two coils on top of the two ends, right? Uh, we're not gonna get into the details of that one. We said the voltage, an AC voltage applied to the primary uh, will generate an AC voltage on the secondary. Uh, this, the voltage on the secondary can be the same or different uh, compared to the voltage on the primary. And it depends on the number of turns on the primary and the secondary. So the more uh, turns equals more voltage. So it, the transformer is uh, going to be governed by this equation here. So the number of turns in the primary divided by the number of turns on the secondary equals the voltage on the primary uh, divided by the voltage on the secondary. For example, if we have a primary with 2000 turns and we put 120 volts AC on that one, and uh, we have a secondary with 200 turns, the voltage on the secondary, it's uh, gonna be 12 volts because the secondary has one tenth of the turns as the primary. So the voltage on the secondary, it's gonna be um, one tenth of the voltage of the primary. And uh, the same way uh, transformers are usually used to reduce voltage. And that's uh, the main uh, purpose of transformers in, in households, right? Uh, the transformers that you may have at your home, it's, uh, are used mostly to reduce voltage from 120 volts to something that is uh, more suitable for electronics. But uh, there are applications where you want to step up uh, the voltage. And uh, you could connect these transformers um, in reverse and put 120 volts over here, and you would get uh, 1,200 volts on the other side. Um, there are some restrictions there, right? Uh, so transformers are usually designed to be used in one direction and not in the opposite. But uh, within some limitations, they can be used in the opposite direction to step up voltages. So if you want to buy a transformer, uh, what, how, how do you specify that? Well, transformers are specified based on their primary voltage, secondary voltage, and the maximum secondary current or power overall. For, ex for example, you could uh, purchase a transformer, uh, 120 volts to 6 volts, 500 milliamps, or 100 volts to 6 volts, 3 watts. As a side note, um, Power in transformers is usually not measured in watts, but in volt amperes. There's a subtle difference there, and it has to do with uh, something called active and reactive power. That's something to, that applies to AC systems, and we're not going to be um, looking at those uh, today. So you could see these as uh, 500 milliamps or three watts, you would not see that as 3W, but as 3VA, as 3 volt and bursts. okay? Let's uh, have a quick look, uh, a quick recap of what we saw today. So we studied electricity and magnetism, and we saw how our conductor carrying a current can generate a magnetic field. And one of the applications for this is to measure current without uh, opening the circuit. And another application is to create an electromagnet. Once we create an electromagnet, we can build a few interesting devices based on that one. 
for instance, relays, solenoid actuators, solenoid valves, electric uh, strikes, motors, and a few more. <clears throat> Um, digging a little bit more into relays, we studied that relays are electrically controlled switches and um, there are other applications for an electromagnet and they allow uh, one circuit to control another circuit with a higher voltage or current. We saw the case of a higher voltage, for instance, uh, when controlling a 120 volt device uh, through a Wi-Fi controller or higher current when controlling your headlamps or other high current devices in your car. Um, they are available in different coil voltages and different switch configurations. And uh, lastly, we had a look at transformers. Transformers work um, on AC only. And they convert one voltage to another one and uh, the relationship between the voltages is the same relationship as the turns ratio. Uh, more turns equals more voltage and less turns, less voltage, of course. And um, there's no electrical connection between the primary and secondary, uh, which makes them totally safe to use when, when stepping on the voltage. And uh, they are specified by input voltage, output voltage, and output current or power um, of the transformer. Okay, and that is all for today. Next class, uh, it's going to be quite interesting. And uh, we're going to have a look at capacitors, diodes, and rectifications, which is the conversion of uh, AC to DC. So. Thank you for attending this class and we'll see you next time.